All right. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, just to let you know it a little bit in advance, we're going to have uh, a good uh, number of, of slides to cover for today. Um, but let's just start asking if you guys have any, any questions about the assignment, which is due tomorrow midnight. And just as a reminder, we are going to have office hours tomorrow at noon. In my chat. All right, looks like we don't have any questions. By the way, we are not going to have a new assignment this week. So you guys gave a, a little bit of a break uh, in case that you need it. Um, and let me share my screen. So the topic we're going to be uh, talking about today just a second, because Zoom likes to hire everything. Um, <laughs> no problem, Rob, no problem. It's just that you catch up with a little bit of breath for what is coming after, <laughs> not to scare you. Um, so what um, the topic that we're going to be covering today is a little bit of, of an introduction to how to use clusters and how to run serial shops using some tools in the clusters, taking advantage of this embarrassing parallel um, category that we, we talked last time, uh, but also a little bit of how the scheduler, meaning this program that organizes the flow of the, of the shops, uh, works in the clusters, okay? So this is more or less what we're going to be discussing today, approaches for dealing with serial shops. Of course, we want you guys and everyone running the cluster to take advantage or, or take the most advantage possible of running in a parallel uh, infrastructure a very short intro to Sinem or Niagara and the Teach cluster because they, they share sim, uh, a lot of similarities. If you have been in one of our intro to Sinem um, sessions, you may find similar things that we discussed there. And then new parallel and run these that are some of the techniques that you can um, you can utilize to, to improve the performance of these serial shops. And sometimes not only serial shops, but some shops that they scale well using those techniques. So we, we kind of reviewed this last class, why parallel programming? Your desktop has many cores, as do the nodes on the Sinec clusters, in particular the Teach and Niagara cluster. Um, so you, your code will run a lot faster if you can use all those cores simultaneously. That's what we, we discuss under uh, the term of uh, concurrently. Or even better, use cores of many nodes uh, simultaneously. And that is the, the distributed memory uh, programming approach, the MPI, that we are also going to cover in a in, in few weeks. So we need to, the, the bottom line is, we need to adjust our programs accordingly, uh, meaning that we need to start programming in parallel. So there are different, different approaches to parallel programming, as we discussed last class, um, but sometimes, either because you develop a code or you inherit a code from a group or for whatever reason, you have a serial code, meaning that only runs uh, on a single processor, meaning that there is only one CPU, one processor that is executing instruction by instruction. Uh, then there are several reasons why we may not push the code further. I'm not saying this is, uh, maybe it's not the best uh, um, series of, of elements to justify by programming, but I'm saying, in some cases, you may not want to, you know, to, to do the extra mile and try to parallelize the code because that, that part is not necessarily trivial depending. Of course, there are a lot of caveats and a lot of um, uh, things to keep on the side because you know, nothing is black or white. There is, there is a scale of, of, of different shades there. Um, but let's say that we're in one of these is this bullet points. If the problem involves a parameter study, meaning that each iteration of the parameter study is, is, is very swift, each iteration is independent, but many need to be done. So that is almost, almost, if you think about it, it's almost a case of embarrassing parallel approach. We discussed this a little bit last time. The algorithm is inherently serial. And there is not much you can do about that. And, and again, one of the take home messages from last class, I hope that we convened that is the algorithms, meaning the, the, the way of implementing things 
that run may be super optimized for a serial code won't be the most optimized for parallel calls. And in some cases, they may not even work. So that requires a rethink of the algorithm and the implementation itself. So that's something to bear in mind. If it is a very complicated thing that you don't even know how to tackle in parallel, then maybe you, you just need to stick with the serial implementation that you know it works. Uh, this is another one, it's a sad one. I, I, I hope that many people is, is start to move away from this, although not necessarily, but if you are running a commercial code and you don't have the source code to modify, then, then <laughs> again, not much you can do, right? Either you, you write your thing from scratch or you keep using the commercial implementation. Uh, big defender of open source, that's why it's a little bit sad to see people doing that. I understand that they had to do it in some cases. Um, you are graduating in six months. You don't go into parallelize that code in, in, in six months because just implementing and debugging the code may take a year. So there you go. You won't do that neither. So sometimes you just have to let your code be serial and run the serial process in parallel. And that is what we're going to be discussing a little bit today. Now, having said that, doesn't mean that you're not going to receive an email from us saying, hey, why are you running on only one core on Niagara? That's, that's not acceptable. And, and, and these are the things that you need to learn to, to mitigate that. So what are our assumptions? There are always assumptions, right? Let's assume the following for, for the code. You have a serial code, that's a good starting point. Your code takes a set of parameters, either from a file or preferably from the command line. I, I don't really mind. I don't think there is a preference, to be honest. I usually, I think I comment this before in one of the assignments, I usually prefer to have a file because then I can keep that as metadata. But if you're going to submit a submission script, then your, your command line arguments to the, to, the, to the shop can be also part of the metadata by including them in the submission script. So not really a preference here or there. Um, I'm inclined to the file approach that we have for the traffic flow assignment, but either way will work. The code runs in a reasonable short amount of times minus two hours, and the reason for that is, in particular on, on, on our clusters, the maximum time you can run a call is 24 hours. After that, it's, it's, it's a no-go situation for us, and there are really good reasons for that. Uh, you have a large parameter space you want to search, which means hundreds of thousands of combinations of values for your parameters that are indicated as common line arguments or in a parameter file. And you can see now how things may fit into a parallel approach by, by just parallel those parameters are running simultaneously the serial implementation. You will probably like some feedback on your shops, things like error checking for tolerance, etc. You want to run your code on sign and meaning Niagara or Teach, of course, otherwise you won't be here. Um, so how do we go about performing this set of regulations efficiently, meaning running on multiple cores uh, at the same time? That's, that's what we're going to be doing now. So what are our concerns from a system administrative or, or sysadmin point of view, but also from the performance of uh, the execution of shops on the cluster so that we can take full advantage of, of, of the machine. And bear in mind, it's not that, you know, we, are, we do this because it's, uh, we, don't any, we don't have anything else to do and we just want to be a pain in your, in your necks because, you know, that, there, there are reasons, right? The, the machine costs a lot to run and we really want to have it fully utilized so that we can actually justify the, the huge amount of, of dollars that we pay per year for electricity, for instance, right? So that's, that's a really good reason. So what are our concerns regarding serial shops running on the cluster? Well, scheduling is done by node. This is not true on the teach cluster, but it is true in our main cluster on Niagara. So you can see there will be similarities, but some differences as well, but you need to bear in mind that this is, uh, <laughs> I come to, uh, to that in a second. Okay? Um, but uh, you, you, you know, there are some similarities and differences in, in, in between the teach and the uh, and, and Niagara. Uh, can I mine Bitcoin on Niagara? I mean, as can you can, but you you shouldn't, right? <laughs> Unless it's part of your research. Uh, <laughs> Listen, we, we, this is, uh, I don't know, maybe Rancid remember, we had situations like this where someone hacked the system. It was the old GPC. And, and you know, like the, the, the Bitcoin thing, they were, they were mining Bitcoin uh, in one of the nodes or something. I don't re even remember. I, I think it was even before my time at Signet, but there was a situation. And, and, and hackers are always trying to sniff, especially in HPC systems, because they are good for doing that. 
Uh, but unless it's part of your research and your supervisor is happy with that because he will see, uh, you know, the allocation going down while you mine bitcoins, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, that's right. Um, what else? So uh, a schedule is done by node, which means each node comes with 16 cores in the teach cluster, approximately 64 gigabytes of memory. So uh, the idea is that you will use that effectively. In, in Iagara, it's, for, it's 40 cores physical, physically, uh, 80 with hyper-threading, and 200 gigabytes of RAM. So again, you, you should be utilizing, especially on Iagara, all these cores uh, you know, uh, uh, in maximum capacity. Use all the processors on the node. You have been uh, given continuously. That's, that's something that we're going to be discussing with load balancing more, more probably at the end of this lecture, but also with OpenMP. Use all the memory that have been given uh, efficiently. That's another alternative, right? If you're, we talk about this, is your program or your problem is memory bound. Uh, then maybe you don't need to use all the cores because you are exacerbating the, the amount of memory that you are using. And then that's okay too, right? Um, so this almost certainly means having multiple subshops running simultaneously on your node, multiple programs right, running on your node. Try to minimize the I.O. This is particularly, we talk about this, I think, in the I.O. part, but this is particular, particularly important for uh, supercomputer centers because we, we have what we call a parallel file system, meaning that all the nodes, all the shops, everything is the same file system. And if there is one shop that is hammering very badly that file system, doing a lot of input output operations, um, you will see it. Everyone will see it. We have improved a lot since several years ago because the file system is new, the, the hard drives are new, everything is a little bit better. But we have had situations in the past because a user or a several users at the same time were doing very heavy I.O., like your computer, your terminal, your connection will basically freeze like just editing a single text file was almost impossible. You had to wait a minute for, a, a, you type a letter and the letter to come back in the terminal. It was impossible either to, to edit or, or work interactively in the login nodes. So bear in mind that we, we, I think we are way bef beyond that, that uh, situations nowadays because we have improved, we have learned ourselves and we also try to make ev everyone aware. So everyone is, is more conscious about that. But again, if that situation happens, it will impact everyone on the on the system, right? Just a little bit of being a good citizen of the of the cluster. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit of of of, of things. So which options we have? Well, uh, let's go through a, a few of them. Uh, and again, let's very much the assumptions that we did a, a few slides ago. So we are talking about serial serial program. So we're going to, we could write a script from scratch which launches and manages the shoot shows. That's a lot of work, but some people have done it actually. If the code is written in Python, you could use IPython Nobu to manage the shoot shows. If the code is written in R, you could use the parallel R utilities or, or libraries to manage the shoot shop. And there is a, a great tool. This tool is amazing. You can run it in your own computer even if you have multiple cores because it's so simple. It's, it's written in, in Perl, I believe. Uh, which is a scripting language, it doesn't really matter, but it's a very simple installation. You can run it almost anywhere um, to manage the subshows. And that's the new parallel one. And we're going to, to see this one at the end, okay? Um, so just a quick, any, any questions about this? And I have the names of the people who is interested about doing Bitcoin, so we're going to keep an eye on you guys. <laughs> Any, any questions about this? All right, so we're going to move to talk a little bit about the specs of, of the clusters, all right? So Niagara is a cluster that has 80, almost 81,000 cores. Um, and it's, it's, it's basically laid down on almost 2,000 nodes. So as I was telling you, we have uh, 40 cores per node. So you do the math and you get more or less those numbers. So each node will have 40 Intel Skyler or Cascade layer. That's the next generation of the Intel cores running at 2.4 or 2.5 gigahertz. So remember what we discussed last class, right? They are not the fastest uh, spinning clocks on, on cores. You can probably find gaming computers that, that has higher speeds in, you know, on the cores. But this is because they, there is a lot of them on a node, on a, on a motherboard, and that, and that is, is a huge source of heating, right? So 
it, it fits all perfectly in what we discussed last time. Uh, basically, we're talking about 188 gigabytes of RAM per node, roughly four gigabytes per core, if you do the math again. We don't have any CPUs, okay, on this cluster. We don't have any local hard drives neither. So these are basically CPUs all connected together with memory, and that is it, okay? No local hard drive. As I say, there is a parallel file system that all nodes see, but there is no local hardware whatsoever. Uh, the total power of the system in terms of, of, of is usually measured in flops, which is floating point operations, is 3.6 petaflops. Uh, that's the deliberate one when you run the test. The theoretical one, again, if you do the math, is, is 6.25, but theoretical is very, very theoretical. Um, where we were very proud to be number 53 when I, system, I think the system was uh, launched initially in the top 500 system. Currently, that was in 2018. Currently, we are at position 83. So that shows you how, how far things evolve. Um, the previous system we had, the CPC, I think was in the top 10. I don't remember exactly, Francis may recall that, but it, position eight or something or 16, uh, but it was it was at the very top notch of the of the first system. But that was like, I don't know, 2008, maybe even earlier than that. Anyhow, things move, move extraordinarily fast on, on this field. The operating system, as you guys have seen, is CentOS, it's a Linux flavor. One thing that we have, this is, this is a, a cherry on top of, of, of the K that we have because not all systems have this. And this is a, when we put on, on Nayara, it was kind of the first places where we were testing the technology worldwide. It's what we, have, we call burst buffer. It's for fast input output operations. And it's nothing else than a, an array, a, a, a farm of solid state devices that you can use for very fast uh, reading and writing data. So that's something that is available to use. I think I mentioned this last time, we had a, a state-of-the-art network connectivity in the nose, it's called InfiniBand, Dragonfly. It's almost, I, I say this one-to-one -one for up to 43, uh, 432 nodes, and then two-to-one beyond that. I think those numbers may be, may be outdated, but it's, it's, it's a good chunk. Basically each, what we call each wing, um, of the system has a one-to-one -one connection and then out of the, of the win is two-to-one. Um, we have a parallel fire system that is shared uh, across the system and it's divided in three categories, home, scratch, and project. And you guys probably have uh, realized about this while using the teach cluster because it's exactly the same. Um, what else? You are familiar with this. I'm going to go very quickly about how to connect to uh, Niagara or teach cluster. You do SSH. Uh, dash Y is one the graphic output as you as you have experience the username and then Niagara .u Toronto or Teach .u Toronto. Okay, you connect to the login nodes and then the rest of the nodes are compute nodes and this is the part that is a little bit new for you guys because you have been running always on the login nodes and that's fine because your runs were short, relatively short, or maybe using a debug shop if you if you had a little bit more of experience. But basically the login nodes, and this is in, it's very relevant for Niagara in particular, where there are thousands of users at the same time connected, are just for developing. Okay. Maybe a small test. I will even argue not testing at all. Some people do that. Compiling, sure, that's okay. Um, because compilation has several stages, as we discussed, so that's 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 fine. But I will say not even a small short test. I, I, I would recommend doing on the on the back on the debug shop. Okay, uh, but basically it's just editing, organizing your files and, and things like that and preparing your shops to be submitted. And that's all what you can do or should do on the login nodes, right? Um, let's talk a little bit about the, the file system because there are some consequences that and, and some things that will start to appear now that we haven't seen so far while running on the teach cluster, okay? So we have these two uh, main places, locations where you can store your data. Okay, there is the home, that is the place where you, when you connect, you are directly placed there. And you can see that uh, when you connect, you are in home. And then I think it's DE for the temp accounts and temp something and the name of the, of the course and then your, your username. But there is also another space, another location called Scratch. Okay, so the, the nice thing is we have these environment variables, dollar sign home and dollar sign Scratch that by doing, by using them, you can just directly go to, to home or scratch. You do CD dollar sign home or CD dollar sign scratch and it takes you there. 
And I have an example here how it looks in my case. Um, there is also a project, I'm not going to talk about project, but this is something that uh, some groups are interested in and it's by request. So no, no, let's not go uh, there. There is also the burst buffer. This is not part of the of the this cluster, it's only for Niagara. But again, it's something I see, I think several of you are using Niagara or probably will try to use Niagara in the future. So it's good that you guys know that. And this bird buffer is, a, a, again, it's a bleeding edge technology that allows you to do very fast input output operations. So something to keep in the back of your mind if, if, if you need to do use that at some point. Now, some things, again, this is a table that compares a lot of the features of the different operate, uh, file systems, sorry that we have on the system. We're going to just focus on how many scratch today, but you can see we have project, we have a bare buffer, and there is an archive uh, that is a, is a backup system or, or archive system, I should say. Um, but let's look at, at, at how many scratch. So I'm not sure if these numbers reflect on the teach cluster, probably they don't, but there is a difference how much data you can put on one and the other. I'm not interested in this right now because for our course, you are not going to be accumulating a lot of data, even if you are doing Bitcoin. Um, but I'm interested more on this column, on the block size and, and other features. So the block size, what it means is, is the minimal unit on, of storage that we are going to be using for a store a file. On home, that is one megabyte. On, on Scratch, it's 16 megabytes. Meaning that, meaning that, that if you have a five, me five megabytes files and size, in home it will take one, uh, five megabytes because the minimal unit is one. But in Scratch, it will take 16 megabytes because that's the minimal unit. So you can see it's a discretization thing, basically, a, 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 a unit, a minimal unit of how much I can store. And that's, that has uh, implications not only on, OK, the file sizes, but also implications on how fast things can be read. And the reason for having a larger block size in Scratch is because usually Scratch is faster. Okay, the other difference, these are some operational differences, like if it is backup or not, if it is uh, purge or not. Again, nothing important or relevant for our course, but if you are a user, a, a consistent user in our system, you, you would like to, to take a look at this. The other important thing, and this is going to be affecting us, is that home, when you are running shows, meaning that you are on the compute nodes, is what we call read only. So you can read from home, but you cannot write to home. So your shops, when they are running your program, should write to scratch. So for doing that, there are two simple things you can do. You either launch the shop from a location on scratch, on the scratch file system, or you either instruct your shop to write to scratch specifically. Okay, and we're going to see some example of this, but this is something to, that you need to be aware uh, when using the, the cluster in, in a shop base. Okay, any questions about this? All right. So you are also familiar with this because you have been loading modules, but maybe the part that is not quite clear, although I think we discussed a little bit about this, is what the module system is doing. Well, the module system is just allowing you to load, to access different type of libraries or programs that are in the system. As you can imagine, we have literally thousands or, or, or maybe even more than thousands in order of magnitude software installed on the system. And so if we have all of them, they will, they will just crash. I think some of you were experiencing uh, side effects when you were trying to load, for instance, the Anaconda module with uh, one of the compilers. And that's because Anaconda brings its own compilers. So it was getting, the compiler was getting confused. Okay, which library should I use? Should I use the Anaconda ones? Because that's the one that, that you load the first, or should I use the one that comes from the GCC compiler? So you can see that even just with five or six modules, you already start to see this, this kind of confusion on the system. So just to try to avoid that and keep things clean and, 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 and basically impose this kind of separation of concerns between the modules, we have this module system. And that's basically what it does is it loads, when you load the module, it basically loads a set of environment variables that allow the system, the operating system, to find the compilers, the libraries, whatever you are loading basically, okay? So I'm not going to spend too much time. You are quite familiar with this module load, the name of the module, module purge basically erases all the modules that you have. Module spider is quite useful when you're not sure about the module, you can do module spider and the name of the, of the module and then it will list the packages. Module available list all the loadable software packages that we have. Module list the, the current list of modules. 
this is particularly to Niagara, so you don't need to worry much about this, but we have two flavors of the modular system, uh, basically native one that we call Niagara environment, and then a CC one that if you are using other Compute Canada systems, you can basically share the same software that you load in other, in other systems, okay? Just to let you know more than anything. Now, this is an example of how you will compile on Niagara, but you have done this on the Teach cluster. So basically, but I changed a little bit here. So this is using the latest module, system that is 2019 um, on Niagara. And this is using Intel compilers and a particular version of CSR. GS, and it's, we have used the new compiler in, across, all over the, the course, I think, but this is using the Intel compiler. So you may take a look at this just to learn a little bit about the Intel compilers, which usually, or in some cases, at least on Niagara, they perform a little bit better than the new compilers. But Again, at the end of the day, you may need to do a comparison uh, apples with apples to know which compiler gives you the, the best results. Um, yeah, that's, I think, all what I want to say from, from this. Okay, this is another important thing that we are going to start using on, on the Teach cluster as well, and refers to testing. So what I mean with testing is, okay, I told you, you shouldn't be running things on the login nodes. So, so far we have been doing that. We have compiled on the login nodes, that's okay. And um, we have run things on the login node and uh, so far has been okay. Things are going to get a little bit more, more demanding on terms of resources. So that won't be so okay, neither for the system, neither for everyone else on the login nodes, okay? So we are going to start running things um, in what we call batch mode or by submitting shops, by submitting requests to the systems. And we're going to talk about how that happened. But basically the idea is that either when you need to run um, your, your code to produce the final results that you are going to submit, or when you want to test your code, you should be doing that not in the login nodes, but um, on a, on a or debug shop. That's, a, that's basically a shop that requests one of the compute nodes uh, to run interactively or throw a, a, a proper shop. So, as I say, I usually prefer not to run any tests on the login nodes, but the rule of thumb is if it takes just a couple of minutes and uh, less than two gigabytes of memory, then you could run it on the login node. Anything that that will, will raise concerns on, on for the system, okay? Uh, you can run the debuggers on the login node. Uh, you probably did this already for one of the assignments um, and, 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 and look at the performance. But my recommendation just for, for getting used to that is to use this debug shop command. And the debug shop is very simple to use. It's just run debug shop. If you don't specify anything, it gives you, I don't remember for the teach node, but I think it gives you a few cores from one node, but you can specify how many in, in, in Niagara, how many nodes you want, because again, Niagara is scheduled by node. On teach, you can specify how many cores you want, okay? Um, the defaults change from one system to another, but again, just play with it. Uh, if we have time, maybe I, I, I do a quick demo. Um, but this is something to, to keep in mind, especially when you're developing and testing, okay? In both systems, I would say. So I was talking about shops and how this batch mode works and the responsible, the mastermind, the, the, the architect uh, that takes care of this is what we call the scheduler. Okay, so in, in any HPC system on the world and in serious, you know, professional style HPC system on the world, you will run things like you will do in your computer, meaning you connect and run the thing. No, you will use what we call a scheduler. Um, the scheduler is a program that basically organizes the workload on the cluster. So it, it's, it's basically, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a, of a maestro in an orchestra. He basically see the resources of the cluster, receive the request from the users to run shops, and identifies when and, and where on the system can be run. That's, it's, it's a very complicated algorithm indeed. Um, so basically what we will going to do from now on is going to submit requests to the scheduler, and the scheduler will find the right moment for your shops to run. How does it do this? Well, it considers many multiple elements, but you look at the resources. On Niagara, it's even a little bit trickier because it has to consider priorities, meaning you have an allocation, are you running on the full allocation? How much of your allocation has been used? How much of your allocation your colleagues have used? So it's a, it's a really complicated problem. 
um, um, what else? Uh, even when you run interactively with the backshop or SR log, uh, if you are familiar with that, we are requesting resources from the cluster. So the scheduler is the one who, who takes care of this. Um, what else? I think I mentioned all of these. Mm, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any, any questions about this? All right. So the scheduler that we use in, in Niagara, but also in the Teach cluster, is called SLAM. Um, basically, what we do, and the, the way I prefer to do it, uh, again, you can do this, especially when you run shops, you can do interactively if the short is small because we have a limit how long interactive shops can run. But the best way to do it is to use uh, this sbatch uh, command. That is, OK, you prepare your shop, you instruct the scheduler how you want to run, and then you submit a request by, by specifying all the request elements in a, in a text file. And that is how it works here. So sbatch is the command that passes that information to the scheduler. And the shop script.sh file, which is going to be a shell file, and we're going to see examples of this in a second, is the file that contains all the information on how we are going to run the shop and what program, indeed, we are going to be running, OK? Um, this comments apply again for Niagara. So I'm going to skip them. But if you're running on Niagara, again, come back to this slide or just go to one of the intro sessions, and, and I will make a much more sense. Now, some terminology that we need to be familiar for uh, using the SLAM scheduler. Um, shop. Basically, is the piece of work for which uh, specific resources were requested. Um, we have the term here, and then the, the jargon in, in, in the Slam language. And how we can access that? Well, we say patch is a log or the back shop are the, the options for us. And all is basically the computing um, components with several cores, 40 or 16 in the case of Niagara or the Teach cluster that share memory. And in Slam, you refer to this by node. And the, the terminology in the scripts is dash dash nodes or dash n, dash capital N, which is different from lower kernel n, as, as we will see. MPI process is one of a group of programs using MPI for, for parallel distributed share memory, sorry, for distributed memory. Uh, SLAM refers to them as task. Uh, usually in the MPI share going, you refer to them as processes. Uh, but but SLAM for the SLAM are tasks, and so you can access them by task dash lower k n or task per node. All these are equivalent. The physical core is the actual physical functional independent execution unit on the node. Uh, in SLAM, it's called billing. Okay. Uh, logical CPU, and there is a difference between this, is an execution unit that the operating system can assign work to. And this is different from the previous unit if you have this hyper-thread technology enabled, where basically allow the operating system to see one physical CPU as two, OK? And these are referred as CPUs on, on, on the SLAM shergon, and you access those with dash dash and CPUs per task uh, in the flags. Some of these flags are not going to be important for today, but they're going to be important when running with OpenMP or MPI, OK? So we're going to come back to the few of them, not today, but in, in, in a week or so, all right? Threads is one of multiple simultaneous execution paths in a program that shares memory. Uh, again, it's going to be important for OpenMP, for instance, and you access those for using NCPUs per task, similar to the previous code, or the environment variable open, uh, OpenMP non threads, OK? And hyper-threading is, is what I mentioned before, is, is the ability to, to pretend that there are more than, than one physical core, right? So as these things are just definitions and going to be more clear, I hope, with, with examples, OK? I talk about hyperthreading. Basically, it's a technology that leverages more physical hardware by pretending that there are twice as many logical cores, which makes this that the operating, C, operating system sees on Niagara 80 logical cores instead of 40. Now, one, one caveat here is you really need to test your program to see if it can take advantage of hyperthreading. That's not always the case. When it works, you may get, you know, something between five, 10, maybe 20% speed up by using hyperthreading. In other cases, it can be decremental. So, you know, your mileage might variate. So you have to test. 
that's the bottom line because it may depend on the implementation but also on the algorithm so there, there are no golden rule here okay again I'm going to skip this but basically you, you it's very easy to use hyperthread on Niagara it's activated for you by default and the only thing you need to do is in case, instead of requesting 14 cores on the on the shop you request 80 on one node and voila it works now let's take any questions about this All right, so let's take a look at a few examples of submission scripts. These are for different cases. So, and then we're going to see one for, we're going to come back to these serial shops and see how we do that with serial shops using uh, uh, our own manager and then something which is way better, which is new part. Okay, so this is an example of an OpenMP submission script. So Rance is going to show you again, this example or, or even a better one. Um, in, in, in next week probably, or yeah, at least on Thursday maybe. But basically what we have is, is a shell script. So this is a, what we call the Shebang. It's a specifying for the operating system. It's just a shell script. It's a, it's a script that is run through the shell. And everything that it starts with hashtag is batch are instructions for the scheduler. So all these, what are the six first lines are instructions for the scheduler. And are using the flags that we discussed a couple of slides ago. So dash dash nodes indicates that I want just one node of the system. CPU per task, this is for a Niagara, is using 40 cores from that node. The time that we are going to run, or the maximum, I should say the maximum time we, we ask the scheduler to run the shop is for one hour. If your program finished earlier, you are billed for less, right? For the actual amount of time that the that they program ran. If your program ran longer than your shop will crash because the scheduler will kill the run in an hour okay bottom line is try to adjust this number very closely to the actual time that it takes the program to run because the smaller it is the faster the scheduler will find a slot and try to run it okay so it's not that you can put 24 hours and okay in 24 it will take way longer because the scheduler is thinking oh he has a good idea how long it's going to take so i'm going to try to fit in my in my in my itinerary or shops to run in that slot okay so try to be accurate as possible when when requesting that then dash dash shop name is a name that you can have for your shops if you have multiple shops running at the same time or or, or even not it, it, it's useful to have something representative for you're trying to do for your own records basically that's dash output. So you are going to see that when you run a shop, there are two files that are generated automatically for you. One is the standard output. So whatever it was dumped into the screen, because you are not going to be seen at the screen, the shop is going to be run whoever, who knows when, um, it's going to go into, into a file, but also the errors produced. If there were any errors, which is something useful to keep in mind when you're running and you're not looking at the code, what is happening, are going to go to files. If you don't specify anything by default, it goes to a file name it after the shop ID, which is a number that is generated when you submit the request. Or you can specify what name you want to take. So percentage J here is, is to preserve the shop ID uh, as part of the name for the file. The other thing that is super useful, at least for me, every time I run, is to get email notifications. So I don't know if this works on the TIT cluster, to be honest with you, but it does work on Niagara. So you can do mail type and equal something. So you get in this case, a notification if the, if the shop fail. I usually keep mail type equal all. So I know when the shop started, when the shop ended and if it fails, of course, or something happened. So all these are instructions for the scheduler. We haven't done anything else than just telling the scheduler how we want to run our shop, meaning our program, okay? Now comes what we need to run. And these are just the commands that you will type uh, during a normal execution of the program. So the first thing I need to do is I need to load the modules that I'm using. So if you are compiling with GCC and CSL and FFTW, all those modules has to be part because the scheduler won't know what do you need to, to run your program. So all those modules have to be loaded there. In this case, it's an OpenMP program. So it's exporting some environment variables. This is going to be clear next week. And it's just executing the program, okay? This is my shop script. It's called openmp underscore shop dot sh. How I run this, how I transmit this information to the scheduler, I just do sbatch and then the name of the shop script. Okay. 
Oh, they, you had a question, sorry. Uh, how can you tell ahead of time how much time you need? Testing, right? Testing. So let's say that you want to run 10,000 iterations in a, in a program. So what I will do is I request a debug shop and I test for maybe 10 iterations, 50 iterations, and then extrapolate from that. As I say, you can try to be as accurate as possible. It's, it's not precise. After you run a couple of times, then you more or less get an idea, right? It may be that your first shop didn't complete on time, but you ran from your 10,000, you ran 8,000 iterations. Well, you know now that next time you need to rerun this and maybe try 5,000 iterations or you increase a little bit the, the world time that you requested. So it's, it's a little bit of testing and extrapolation of your previous knowledge of how the, the, the execution of the program works. In some cases, if it is not possible, you start with a case that you know it will fit and then extrapolate from that. Um, now, one thing that we are not going to be talking today about this, but it's very important, is a feature in many programs uh, called Checkpoint. And Checkpoint is the ability of a program to say the actual state of the program, so that then when you restart the program, can load that data and continue from there. Why I say that is because we have a 24-hour limit, and in many cases, uh, there's no way that you can finish your shop on, on that time. So for instance, my simulations um, can take months. So eventually I had to run like 30 shops just to get one whole simulation. And that is more than, than you know, that the maximum amount of time. So I, every day I had to, when my simulation ends, I had to dump uh, the current state of the simulation and then what we call checkpoint and then load that again and restart from there. Yeah, that is, is a very common pattern, right? The, the, the simulations taking, especially if you do high resolution, especially if you are trying to do some fringe physics or, or effects that are not captured by simple algorithms, it's not uncommon. So having checkpoint is fundamental, right? And using a standardized file formats, as we discussed, like NetCDF, that helps a lot as well. And we may see or not, depending on time, there are the libraries like MPI can take full advantage of dumping things, saving things in a very optimized way when you use this standardized file form. So, okay. Good questions though, sorry. I, I, I went a little bit out of, of context, but, um, and here you have the say, so all what I, I just described to you is here on, on text on the slides, okay? So it's exactly what, what they say. The only thing I haven't mentioned yet is I will put, because as you see, I'm running just from the, wherever that file is, uh, I will put this executable and this, this shop script on scratch. So I can submit it from scratch and then it will be able to save the data on the current directory, or I have to specify that within the program itself. But remember, this is one of the important things. It's, it's, a, it's a interesting or not interesting, but it's a common source of failure in shops when you try to run from home. And then the error is, oh, I couldn't write my file. Something is wrong with your operating system and there's nothing wrong. It's just that home is read only when you run from, from the schedule, okay? This is another example, it's an MPI example. So the, the first part is very similar. In this case, we are requesting two nodes because we are requesting two nodes. We, the number of processors is 80. I'm not going to use hyperthreading here. I'm going to use 40 and 40. Uh, again, this is just something you need to test and see. Remember the weak and, and, and strong scaling we talked last class? Well, that's where things start to get together, right? Now I had to test, I, I can increase the number of processors, I can use hyperthreading or not, and see how the program scales. Does it perform better? Does it perform a little bit better? Is it worth it? You know, those kind of things. Same idea as before, you load the modules that you need, and then you run your program. And again, I will keep this for when we do MPI, but this is an example of how a submission script for an MPI program works or looks like, okay? Now, a couple more of things, and then we go to back to the serial part. Um, how to monitor your shops. After you submit your shop, I, I told you, you had this email feature that you can receive notifications if your shop is running, when it starts to run, when it ends, when it crashes, if it crashes. There is the SQ command that shows the, the shops in queue. And if you do sq-u and your username or you just dash user, it shows your specific shows. That will be more, more interesting for you probably. You can look at a specific shop when using dash j and the ID that you get when you submit the shop. You can do sq-start and the shop ID, and that will give you an estimate of when the shop may start. 
Now, bear in mind this estimate is dynamic. It means it may change minute by minute because the picture of the system that the, that the scheduler has changed minute by minute and it becomes a user with a lot of priority, then it will probably be put before your shop if you don't have as much priority. Uh, this is a great, a great tool. It's, it's a, I'm proud to say it's developed by, by Rancis Shop Perf. It gives you an overview, uh, an overview of the performance of the shop in real time. So the shop has to be running, of course, but it tells you how much percentage of the CPU, how much percentage of the RAM is using, if, how much IO is doing. So it's a good idea to keep in mind to know about the performance of your shop. If you need to cancel a shop because you realize, oh, I didn't recompile my, my, my executor while I'm running the old version or I screw something in my parameter file, you do S cancel and then uh, dash I the shop ID, okay? Or if you need to cancel all your shops, that is a common situation if you have cascade shops. Uh, if you are in the situation as, 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 as Rob or myself, where we have to concatenate runs, then you, what you do is you submit the 30 runs or 10 runs if you want to be a little bit uh, cautious and at the same time so you start with shop one and then you say when shop one is in then you do shop two and so on so on the advantage of that is if you do that it's very it's very likely your shops after the first one starts they will roll down very very uh, immediately after each other so because you aggregate uh, priority in the queue and, and that is a, it's a, something i would recommend but if you realize that your first shop has a type or a back, then you want to cancel all of them. So S cancel dash U will cancel all your, your shops. Be careful about that, but, but it, it can be useful in some cases. S info uh, dash P and the partition give you an overall view of how many nodes are available in different partitions. And there's S account uh, gets information of your recent shops. So those are a little bit of the monitoring tools that you may have, okay? Yeah, more yada, yada, yada. I'm going to skip this. Uh, let's go back to Syria now. Okay, any, any questions about this? I hope, Rod, that you are using this, this uh, approach of concatenating the shops. If you don't try that, this is, is really, really useful. I, that's the first time I hear about it. So uh, it's something oh, I have okay. to try. I may post a, a link in the in, in the chat, but I will definitely recommend that because it's it's ninety nine percent guarantee that if you do that, then when one shop ends, the other, boom, starts right away because you have at least one day of aggregation of priority in the worst case, but even more if the first shop took longer to start, right? So and over the last two weeks, it's gotten as bad as two days, like 48 hours okay. before I, okay. I got so, it. Yeah, it, will, it, it requires a little bit of coordination between the shops. Like you need to tell, okay, start after this one, but there is there are ways to, to actually do it. In I, I usually don't do it automatically. I, I submit a shop, I get the shop ID and say, okay, start after the shop ID and do the, but you can, you can automatize that as well. But I will recommend do it because it's, it's quite efficient in terms of waiting times between shops, right? Yeah, uh, it's uh, especially when like, some of these runs can take up to three months. Um, exactly. So, so exactly. it means being available all the time to. Yeah, yeah. And, and you can resubmit. just be specific that to start only if the previous run was successful, right? If something goes yes. wrong, it's not like you're going to be wasting 20 shops or nothing. You, you stop right away as soon as you detect a problem. Yeah, just I, remind I think me the, and, I, and I post a link about that. Yeah, I think the other issue with getting, um, I, I think our group overused its allocation. I think Slurm was not going to attack automatically. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a way to, that is an issue for sure, but this is a way to alleviate a little bit in the sense that you will keep aggregating priority, right? But yeah, if you, if you exaggerated the whole priority of the group, then you may be still limited, right? But yeah, you know. Okay. All right. So, okay, let's go back to Syria now. So we talk about running the, the, the name of the game for today was to try to run shops that were serial, but they're still using efficiently the resources of the cluster. And the questions that we may have in mind is, does it use all the cores? Yes. Will any of the cores be wasting time uh, not running? Not if all the sub shops stay the same amount of time. So these assumptions are, I'm going to be running a shop that takes a slightly different parameters files, 
uh, or conditions, and all of them more or less will take the same time. So in that case, if you bear, if you keep those assumptions, then this this submission script can work for you. And uh, let's go through it very quickly. It's a it's a shell script again. Instructions for the scheduler: one node. We want to use the forty cores. In this case, if you were running on on the disk cluster, it will be sixteen cores, right? Um, we are asking one hour. It's an estimate again, as, as I was saying. We, we need to have more or less an idea. But basically, this estimate is is the estimate that takes one of these shops to run because we're assuming the more or less with some deviation. Maybe all of them take roughly the same amount of time. Let's say forty five minutes, and then you you take fifteen minutes of, of precaution if you wish. Uh, the name of the shop: serial time eight. It could be serial time forty, serial time sixteen, whatever. Uh, then what I'm loading. So in this case, I'm loading the Intel module because I was using the Play compiler and CSL because I need the library. What I'm going to do, this is, this is uh, another thing you can do. Let's say this submission script is stored in my scratch directory. Then I'm going to do CD slam sub dir. This I don't think is needed anymore. If you submit a shop, the scheduler will remember, but I know the school, so I prefer to do it this way. And then this is my layman way of running things in parallel. I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to have a, a, a shop deal in, in shop deal one, two, three, up to 40 in this case, because there are 40 of them. Semicolon means is like in the May file, remember? It, it continues on the same, on the same uh, line. So I, I see into shop deal one, I run my code that is above in the previous directory and shop deal one will have the parameter files that are going to be reading. That's why I like the parameter file. And it's part of the, the, the results that you get as well. And then you use this ampersand. This ampersand means for the operating system that you keep running in background, okay? And the operating system is ready to receive more instructions. You can do it with any command line uh, tool that you're running. You can do this trick. You put the ampersand and the operating system say, oh, you want me to run this? Okay, boom, I'm running this. What else do you want me to do? It's, it's immediately responding to you. Because it does in that way, at the end, we need to include a wait because as soon as the scheduler finds the end of the submission script, it will kill your shop. But if you say wait, then it will wait until all the, all the background processes are, are terminated, finished. And this is the simplest way you can run things in parallel. Basically, you instruct by hand, one by one, which task you want to run. You keep all the cores. It can be eight, it can be four, it can be 16. You adjust accordingly to the system. Uh, you run uh, all the processes that you want to run. It can even be different processes if you wish, but ideally, in, in, we are going to see why in a, in a second, this, this could be um, a better case, okay? Oh, thank you for posting that, that link. Uh, okay. <laughs> all right, so any questions about this? So this is our first approach to running serial shops in parallel, right, on the cluster. Right. So another way to do this uh, is, or a little bit more elegant, uh, same idea, I'm going to run, uh, 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 so in this case, we're going to change a little bit the assumptions. We can assume now, or we will assume now, that uh, not all the runs may take the same time, okay? Uh, the, the, the more part of the, of the communication to the schedule is more or less the same. I increase a little bit the time because we are not sure how long each process run now. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to define a function. This is a, this is an elegant way of, of basically running things in parallel. I'm going to be using the same trick as before, the, the ampersand to indicate to run things in background, which means the, the scheduler or the operating system indeed will keep feeding process to be run by the different cores. What I'm going to do is define a function do by four, which basically submits the uh, sequence of four shops. And then I'm going to feed this function with a sequence of 100. A sequence of 100 generates values from one to 100, basically. And uh, that can be seen as an input file or the name of the parameter file or, uh, or a command line argument, whatever you want to think. But basically, we'll run this variable time code 100 times in batches of four. So what happened here is, is running four of these processes at a time, and when one finishes, it keeps feeding and feeding and feeding and feeding. Okay. Um, now, 
this, as I say, this is not too profound. It's doable. It can be okay, but this is not the best way you can do it. And I tell you in a, in a second why. I mean, there are several things that are already here. There is no load balancing, meaning that if the first run finishing 10 seconds and the last one finishing 20 minutes, you are waiting for the next batch of shops for 20 minutes for the for the one that takes the longest. And you have the rest of the course either for that time wasting resources. Uh, there is no shock control. If something fails in the, in the middle, like if run should fail, then you, you basically wasted all that. Um, no fault tolerance, no multi shop, multi no shops. So with this waste, you cannot spread to multiple nodes. You could do it, but again, it's going to ask from you to create something new. Okay, so there is something that does all this, and this is called new parallel. Is is as I told you, a pair script. Uh, it's super versatile. Um, it get your many cases signed to different cores or different different nodes uh, without much complication. I would say uh, you invoke it using the parallel command. Of course, you have to install it first, but basically, it's, it's very simple to use. And we are going to see examples of this. Okay, this is an example of how to use new parallel. Again, not the most optimized way, but it's a way it will work. Instructions for the scheduler again, loading the modules that we need. We will need to load the new parallel module. Okay, so it's its, it's own program. As I told you, you can install it. I have installed it in my laptop and it works perfectly fine and you can run it without the scheduler. So you, even if you put those things, it won't care because these are seen by as, as comments from the shell. So you can keep even your scheduler and try to run it on, on your computer. You won't have the module system though, but other than that, all what is related to parallel should work if you install parallel there. And then let's say in this case, I want to run with 80 cores. I could run with eight cores. It doesn't really matter. What I'm connecting here though, is the slam task per node variable, which was assigned by the end task per node to 80. So if I set to eight, for instance, this will be a, if I say to 16, I get 16. And then what I do is, okay, this is a way to instruct a new parallel, run all these things that are between the double, 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 smaller than sign EOF up to the EOF. So all this is, is input for new parallel. And each line represents one show, one program that has to run. So it's the same example as we saw at the beginning, CD shop did one, my code, and then just a, a message saying echo shop, do, shop one done and so on until how many shops you want to have. You can have as many shops as you want. New parallel will take care of putting them in batches of 80 or eight or 16, depending what numbers you write here, okay? The dash A is the one that specify how many shops or, or, or programs are running at the same time, okay? Um, so what this new parallel doing well is, is, is it's basically what we call a, a, a subshop manager. Uh, so a subshop finish, it assigns a new subshop to the free processors and, and continue this, this thing. Um, basically, because it keep an eye in each process, it has low balance included. Because if my first shop finish, and in, let's say we have eight processors and the others are running, it will take processor, uh, process nine and fit to processor one. And, and so on. I'll show you a plot in a second that will be more, more clear. Um, the other thing that is very good is it keep a log of the soup shop. So if something happens and, and one soup should dies in the process, then you can restart from there. It's some sort of, of it's not checkpoint, but it basically allow you to keep track of which processes uh, or which programs were running this, this long list. This is, for, for, for instance, an example of when you are running without new parallel, like doing this by hand implementation. And, and you can see there are a batch of age, uh, eight, sorry, eight processes or eight programs running at the same time. And then one, two, three, four, 32 programs running. It takes 17 hours, that's, that's depending on how long it takes, but you can see uh, this, this rectangles indicate for how long each process ran. And, and, our layman implementation uh, wait until the, the, the largest or the longest program have to run to start the new sequence. New parallel doesn't need that. As soon as one finish, it brings another from the, from the list of programs to run and keep feeding into the processors. And you get from 17 hours to 10 hours with a 72% utilization versus 42% utilization. 
So it's, it's a really neat tool to have. It's very easy to implement, very easy to use, and very easy to install, as I, as I, uh, as I told you. This is another example of new parallel, reading this list of shops from a file text, which again is something interesting. And in this case, I'm putting the same list of shops as I had before in a, in a file text called subshops. The submission script looks pretty much the same, but now what I'm feeding into new parallel is, well, this flag is to not run if the file is empty, uh, but it's feeding basically the list of shops um, that uh, that they had to fit in, in, into the parallel. Run says yes, no problem. Sorry that um, I, I, I extend in a little bit, so no worries about that. Um, just, just a comment to run says I didn't want to distract myself typing in the chat. Um, so any questions? I have one more example to show you about no parallel. I believe if you guys don't mind the time. Um, any questions about this example so far? Okay, let's, let's see uh, some of the flags. I think I show you dash, dash shops or dash A is to indicate how many um, processes we want to run at the same time. Basically, this value you want to match with the number of cores that you have available on the node. For instance, if it is the teach cluster, we're talking about 16 cores. If it is uh, Niagara, we're talking about 40 or 80, depending if you want to try hyperthreading or not. But again, you can grab that, as I show you in my examples, directly from SLARM. And that's the value that you set for number of tasks per node. Okay. This shop log uh, option with a name for the file is the one that can keep track of the logs for the, for the shops that you have completed. So it will tell you, but not only that, then you can use the dash dash resume flag to read the, the file that you generated and then new parallel will pick up from the last shop that didn't run properly. So the dash process that didn't finish properly will, will be the one that they start. So it's a good, a good thing to keep in mind. You can also dash, uh, use dash dash pi to split the standard in into different chunks. So you can have separate files uh, it's basically saving the output. In some cases, it can be useful or not if you want to have separate standard outputs generated. Uh, most of the people is always interested in the, in the files that you save, but if you want to have the, the logs of the files separated, that could be useful as well. Um, so let me show you an example. I, I told you this is something that is difficult to do. It's not impossible. You can still do it with some good amount of, of, of shell programming. But it's, it's, it's not trivial, I would say. But new parallel can help you to run these serial shops across different nodes. So far, we have seen examples of running in multiple cores within one node, but you can also span to multiple, multiple nodes very easily with new parallel. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to indicate I want to have more than one node, in this case, four nodes. I'm going to, again, this is an example, uh, keep it in mind, Niagara, but you can adjust to, to each cluster by saying number of tasks per node 40 to 60. The time is 12 hours now. And then uh, my shop name is no parallel multi node example because I want to expand to different nodes. All right. I'm going to do the same trick as I was doing before. My, my modus operandi usually is I, I compile, I keep my, my executables in home. There is a good reason for doing that. Well, I don't know if it is a good reason, but I usually keep my source code in home because source, uh, sorry, home is backup. The scratch is not. Again, nothing to be too concerned for the course, but if you are using as a regular user, the cluster is something that you may want to keep uh, uh, back in, in the back of your mind. So I compile my course on, on, on home, and then I run everything from scratch. And the, 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 the approach I take is I create directories and folders for projects. Let's say I'm running, um, I don't know, Neutron Star Black Hole Simulation. Uh, and then within that, I, I have subdirectories for each job that I run. And then um, I, I either copy the executable to that directory or refer to the home, doesn't really matter. I, I usually like to copy because in terms of reading the operating system, the file system is a little bit better in performance. So I move it to Scratch or I copy to Scratch and I have my submission script on that directory in Scratch. And that's why I always keep the CD, the Slurm submit there. This is an environment variable that the Slurm fills with the value that has the, the directory from, the, from where the shop was submitted. And again, I keep my submission scripts as metadata to the whole run, right? 
Uh, this is something that we are going to learn in next week, uh, how to set uh, this variable for running multiple threads, but I don't want to run multiple threads now. I do want to run new parallel. So that's why I'm loading my new parallel. And this is a trick to getting the names of the nodes that were assigned to me for this job. So S control show host names, S learn node list, uh, basically give you, you can run this, it will give you the list of the nodes that the scheduler assigned for your shop. So this remember, it's executed at the moment that your shop starts. So CD into the directory, load the module, and then get the host, basically get the names of the nodes that were assigned to your shop. Now, the way to run with this is I'm going to run parallel. That's, that environment is to export, because remember, this is going to be running a different node. So no shared memory whatsoever. Everything that you have in your mind, the show hard in its mind is, is lost. So I'm going to pass the uh, variables OpenMP, uh, number of threads, path, LD library path, and then I'm going to ask the uh, new parallel to keep track of the logs in case that something bad goes on. And this is the shop, the name of the file I want to, to store the things, slam shop dir .log. again, another environment variable. Number of shops, number of instances I want to run in this case is the slam number of tasks per node. And then this is where the host list of files come into play. So here I will have the list of nodes assigned by doing s, s dash s, dash s, sorry, and then dollar sign host, I'm giving parallel the name of the, of the nodes that were assigned to me. The working directory is assigned to the PWD, or I could just use a slam sub dir. And then I will have within their subdirectories CD serial shop dir. And then this operator means that the previous command was successful. And then my, my submission script. Now, this is a, a new nomenclature in, in New Parallel. When I use these curly braces, it means this is a, um, how to say, a placeholder for whatever range I put here. So for instance, I here I have 800 instances of this shop running or this program running, which are going to go from one up to 800. Zero, zero with leading, leading, uh, leading zeros, if you wish. Zero, zero, one, zero, zero, two, zero, zero, three. And those can be, again, can be subdirectories or it can be parameters. You, you figure out what that means depending on the command line arguments of the of the executable you're running. And this goes into here. So it will go into CD uh, serial shop uh, serial shop did 001 and then execute do serial shop 001. Okay, and so on until 800. But this is an example, of course, you can you can customize this as you as you as you see fit for your problem or your program. Uh, it's an example of running in multiple different nodes, not only multiple cores within a node. Uh, there are more options, way more options um, that you can pass to new parallel. There are specialized ways of passing combination of arguments to functions. There are ways to modify arguments to functions on the fly. Uh, there are special ways for formatting the output as well. Uh, there's a lot of information. I think Francis may, gave a talk some time ago about new parallel. Um, so and another tricks to run serial shops on Niagara as well. The last thing I want to mention very quickly, I know that we are a little bit beyond the time we started late, but it's a lot of material to cover is using run this. And this is basically something that can speed up your code, especially if you have a little bit of file IO. No problem, Rob, I apologize again for taking long, but this will be in the recordings if you guys want to, to take a look after. Um, you can use, in general, up to 70% of the RAM, of the memory of the nodes. Remember, our nodes don't have local hard drive. Right? So you can use 70, up to 70% of the, of the RAM, that's roughly 44 gigabytes on each, on a regular node. Uh, this is directly accessible by, by saving things into deb-shm for shared memory. It's, 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 it's something, it's a feature of Linux, of the operating system, nothing to profound about that other than it's, it's directly accessible. Uh, it's much faster than traditional hard drives, um, but it requires that you stage your data in and out, meaning that as soon as your shop ends, if you didn't move whatever you save into RAM, it, it will vanish basically. So this is an example of how to do that. Um, again, instructions for the scheduler, nothing too profound, modules being load. And I'm going to create in this case in depth uh, share memory, basically on RAM, 
a directory with my username, so it's unique to me, and then working directory. And then I'm going to copy whatever I have in my submission directory into that directory, sit into that directory, and then execute whatever I have to do there. Wait until all my processes finish there, and then compress everything into my, my uh, SLARM directory. If I don't do that, this is my way of moving things out. If I don't do that, then whatever was generated on RAM, as soon as my program finishes, is, is gone. It's like you turn off the computer and you didn't say your variables, basically that, okay? Simple trick, very efficient in some cases, depending on the IO pattern that you may have, right? And I think that's, that's the last example I want to, to show you few summaries, um, you guys can read it later if you want, but basically um, be aware of the details of the code aware, uh, as well uh, uh, as the details of the hardware. If you need to run serial shops on clusters with multicore architecture, be sure to do it in batches. Do it by hand if you want. My recommendation will be try always new parallel is super efficient and very easy to implement. Uh, there are a lot of details in this tech talk that Rancis uh, gave some time ago. And remember, if you have a, a very a heavy I.O. pattern in your code, you may want to try run this and you may get surprised by the improving performance, especially if we are talking about serious I.O. patterns. If you are running on Niagara, I would also recommend to take a look at the burst buffer, okay? Because it can be, it can be almost as good as the memory and there is a trade-off, right? As soon as you put things in memory, your memory, your free memory, reduces right so if your code also uses memory it's going to be a, a competition of resources there okay a few more references about the topics we talked today and i see a couple of questions so mohammad i just wanted to confirm with do we have an assignment for next week no no we will have an assignment uh, presented next week but we don't have an assignment that is going to be presented today or tomorrow okay so you guys can take a rest uh she said what is the office hours tomorrow at noon at noon, okay? If that doesn't, doesn't work, uh, she said for whatever, yes, noon to 1 p.m. If it doesn't work, uh, let me know and we can find another another time for you. I have another office hours for another course running from 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, so it could be a little bit earlier or after that time. For any of you, if you guys have other commitments or, or uh, it's, it's not working for you, the time just let us know. And I apologize again, yesterday we both were, um, tie with, with Francis something else we couldn't we couldn't make it to the usual time but we are going to come back to that time slot as well 2 to 3 p.m on, on Wednesdays okay all right and sorry again we we went a little bit beyond the time today but it was a good amount of material to to cover um and if you guys don't have any other questions I may stop the the recording uh, now and I may see you tomorrow in office hours